Uh, my name is Patrick Ball. I was one of the experts in the trial, and I spoke about the statistical finding consistent with the prosecution's hypothesis that acts of genocide were committed. There's a little, here it is. Um, the fundamental conclusion that we did, and I'll walk through how we got to that, is a comparison of the mortality rates between the indigenous community and the non-indigenous community uh, in the three municipi municipal, uh, municipios of uh, the Ischil region. In particular, through integrating four databases and estimating the deaths that we could not observe, we estimated that 2,147 uh, deaths were occurred as a result of killing by the army, excluding other state forces, uh, killing by the army to indigenous people in that community. According to the census of 1981, there were approximately 39,000 uh, people of indigenous ethnicity living in that region, which yields a crude mortality rate of 5.5%. That is, 5.5% of the indigenous people alive in April of 1982 had been killed by July of 1983. Now, to a statistician, genocide, it is not enough in, if, for an argument about genocide to show that many people of the target community have been killed. We also need to show that the people who were not targeted were not killed. That is how we would understand, in a statistical sense, targeting. That some people were not killed. And the not killed category in this uh, hypothesis would be the non-indigenous people who were uh, living in the three municipios of the uh, Ischil region at the, in, during the same period. And we estimate that 41 people uh, from the non-indigenous people, a uh, non-indigenous community were killed. Of course, that's a much lower rate because it's, a, it's also a lower population basis. So it's about 0.7% of those people were killed. From, a, from the, a statistician's point of view, the fundamental conclusion here is not necessarily either of these numbers independently, but rather their comparison, the ratio between the two which in public health terms is understood as a relative risk. That is, the ratio of the, ri the, the proportion of indigenous people killed to the non-indigenous people gives us the difference in the probability of being killed between the two communities. That is, we can interpret this number, 7.9, as that if you were indigenous, your probability of being killed by the army was eight times greater than if you were non-indigenous in this period. Uh, in this region. Now, these again are only homicides committed by the army, uh, and we are relating it to the census of 1981. Both of those are interesting uh, points that I'll, I'll touch on later if there's time, which there almost certainly won't be. But perhaps you'll come to my talk tomorrow at Lhasa, where I'm going to problematize all of these numbers in great depth and make it much more complicated. Uh, for those of you who've been saying that 200,000 people were killed in the armed internal conflict in 1960, 1996, that number is probably not right. That's, it's not right. I, I calculated it, so I can tell you for the Truth Commission, it's not right. We'll talk about it tomorrow. So please come to the talk. Um, so we'll, we'll skip forward to the next slide and say that, again, this data came from, uh, first, the census of 1981. This is the page from that census for Nebach. And then from four data sources. First, the International Center for Human Rights Research, the CIIDH. Then the REMI Project, <coughs> the Catholic Church. Uh, also the Commission for Historical Clar Clarification and the National Program for Compensation. These are all named individuals. These are not lists of groups. And this is a big point that I'll talk a lot about tomorrow. Uh, these are people who are identified by at least one forename and one surname, and for whom we have at least a year of death, if not month and day. We have relatively few days of death. And we have the municipio of death. So these are well-identified records. <coughs> Anything else was excluded from this analysis, and we uh, calculated those exclusions by means of a bit of math. So let's talk a little bit about the notion of registration and under-registration. A lot of times when we talk about statistics, we're talking about what we have in our hand. We have a list, and we count the elements in the list, and we say, that's how many people died, because that's how many we have in the list. And a lot of times, we're worried about how many people we can verify. So we filter the list. We take a bunch of people out of the list who may have been killed and we have their names, but for some reason we can't verify them. That's not how statisticians do it. Statisticians are interested in what the total population of deaths is. And our job then is to start with what we can observe, represented here by these white intersecting circles, in order to 
estimate the entire population, which is what we can observe plus what we cannot observe. And we use a bit of probability theory to estimate from what we observe to what we cannot observe. This is not simply so we can get a higher number. Not at all. In fact, the total number is of relative unimportance to most statisticians. Rather, the point is that if we are going to make an argument about patterns in which we are comparing one category to another, whether that's March to June over a, an analysis over time, whether it's Chahul to Kotzal, if we're doing an analysis over space, or in this case, the indigenous to the non-indigenous community. We must have unbiased estimates of both in order to compare them fairly. So it is completely inadequate to work with only what you know. Because one community may have told you their stories at a more enthusiastic rate than the other community, which would create false statistics. So we fix the statistics using some probability theory. And the way we do it is this. Now, I actually did this proof for Judge Barrios in court. And I was delighted when, when I got to the, and that is how we estimate the unobserved deaths. She smiled, looked at me, and nodded. The universal uh, indication that a light bulb has gone off. She got this proof, and I was delighted. I looked at the defense table. There was somewhat less uh, in the way of light bulbs. So we worked from, as I said, I'm not going to do the proof here. There's, there's not enough time. Please come tomorrow, where I will be less respectful of my time limits, and I will make sure to do the proof. Um, <clears throat> the key here is that we're using the intersection pattern. The, the rates, or excuse me, the levels at which the data sets document the same events. We're looking at, for example, across all these events, across all these data sources, if we consider the number of people who are documented by the CIIDH, REMI, the CEH, and the PNR, there are two of them. Two people among the thousands of people documented, only two people show up in all four data systems. While at the same time, there are about 1,000 who are in the PNR and not in any of the other data sources. There have been people who've raised questions about the quality of the PNR. I think actually from a statistical point of view, the PNR is at least as good as the other data systems and probably a lot better than one of them, which I will not name here. Um, but it's the one that is often considered the most popular. It's not the commission. Have I hinted enough? All right, I'll move on. Um, so because we've done an estimate, an estimate is bounded by an error interval, a confidence interval. Sometimes lay people call these a margin of error. It's not quite a margin of error because it's not plus and minus the same amount. Uh, the error is asymmetric because of the way we're doing the calculation. But this estimate of 2,147 people uh, killed by the army, uh, indigenous people in these regions during this period, is in a confidence interval between 1996 and 2325. Uh, in our report, we. Uh, that we gave to the court, we provided the technical background for how the calculation is done for the confidence interval. Um, the point of presenting these confidence intervals, the key point here is that these intervals uh, come nowhere near each other when we compare them. So this is the bar for the number of indigenous people killed during the period of Rio Smont's government. Uh, the dark blue area are the number of people we observe to have been killed. The light blue area are the number of people we estimate to have been killed. The width of the bar indicates the population basis. It's proportional to the population basis, about 39,000 people. And this error whisker, this little line here, indicates the range of, of, uh, of probable estimates. This green bar next to it has all the same characteristics. Its width is, the, uh, is proportional to the number of non-indigenous people who are alive in that region in that period. The dark area is the number we observe. The light area is the area we estimate. You notice that they're very, very different. And that's really the whole point to this argument. The whole point is that they are so different that it is completely implausible that that would occur by chance. And so to a statistician, we would conclude that therefore the evidence is consistent with the hypothesis that the Guatemalan army committed acts of genocide against indigenous people. Now, this graph is also a little bit of a curveball because we're slipping in other periods. These are a series of 16-month periods that precede and follow the government of Rio Smont. Um, and what I think is interesting about this graph is that it's clear that the rate of killing against indigenous people is substantially higher, substantially higher during the government of Rio Smont than in previous and succeeding periods. 
Now, it may seem that the rate of killing against non-indigenous people declines slightly, but it's within the error. We cannot reject the hypothesis that these are all the same rates here, these green, little green bars, uh, because they all have overlapping confidence intervals. But we can say that the rate of killing against indigenous people uh, it, during the Rios Mont government is substantially greater than in previous or following periods. Um, the prosecution asked me also to make some comparisons between uh, killing in the Ashil region and other uh, and recent genocides, particularly Rwanda and Bosnia. Now, comparable statistics, reliable statistics, do not actually exist. We know quite a bit about Bosnia, actually, uh, thanks to the Research and, uh, and Documentation Center in Sarajevo. They've done a terrific job, a nearly complete enumeration of deaths uh, in the Bosnian conflict. But for Rwanda, the statistics are appalling. Uh, we really have very, very little clarity. The only place that we have anything like a clear finding is in the Kabuye prefecture. And if we consider all victims, we cannot distinguish the victims by ethnicity. We find that approximately 20% of all the people alive at the beginning of the genocide in Kabuye had been killed by the end of it. And the reason that I present that statistic is that it's, it's actually pretty close to the total killing rate across the period 1979 to 1986 in the Ashil region which comes out at about 22%. So that's, that's quite interesting, that in some sense there's a sort of a commonality of this notion of 20% of total deaths uh, in, these, in these other genocide cases. Srebrenica also, about 20% of the people alive at the beginning of July 1995 had been killed by the end of 1995, nearly all of whom were killed in the three-day period uh, as the enclave was emptied. So I found that, I found that uh, evocative, uh, and we presented that. So let's come back to this notion of bias and why it's so hard. <clears throat> the problem is that while we're living in these white circles, while we're living in the world of documented deaths, it's impossible for us to tell the difference between the reality on the left, where in fact we only document about a third of the deaths, and the reality on the right, where we've documented almost all of them. It's, it's impossible to tell, while we're only looking at the documented deaths, whether we've got only a little fraction of it or we've got nearly the entirety. And that's important because it might be that for one community, say the indigenous community, we have very good documentation. It could look like this, while for the non-indigenous community we have poorer documentation. And that would create a bias which would be unfortunately a bias in the direction of the prosecution's argument. And whenever you're doing a scientific argument you want to create biases that go against the hypothesis you're testing. So that's the key to motivating our, our estimation. But it also leads us to look at some of the data sources, in particular the PNR and the census, and ask ourselves the question, if there were some systematic problem in this data source, would we nonetheless, and we corrected it, would we nonetheless reach the same conclusion? So what we did is we took the records that are only documented by the PNR. We took records that did not appear in Remy, in the commission, or in uh, the CIIDH, but did appear in the PNR. And we systematically, well, randomly, deleted sections of those records. So we deleted up to half of them. And then we recalculated the ratio, the relative risk, of uh, being killed by an indigenous person relative to a non-indigenous person in this period and this time. And we found that by deleting half the records in the PNR, we still have a relative risk of almost five. Our argument is sustained if we assume that half of the people who spoke only to the PNR made their stories up out of thin air. And I think that that is a deeply implausible claim, since the PNR's records were, uh, PNR's findings were substantiated by death certificates and uh, investigations and other things. So while there may be some PNR records which are falsified, this analysis shows that the conclusion that we draw is not affected by the possibility of, in fact, a quite substantial number of falsified records. Similarly, it is, it is known to demographers that censuses systematically under-register under people who uh, are not urban and people who are uh, of um, excluded ethnicities. And this Guatemala is a classic case. So uh, mathematical demographers and applied demographers did a lot of research on Guatemala in the 70s and 80s looking at the early censuses, the census of 1951 and 1964. And they found in those censuses that indigenous people were under-registered by about 15%. Now, for my argument, this is quite problematic because 
I'm using the census of 1981 as the denominator. And if the denominator is too small, I will be, too, if the indigenous denominator is too small, I will be inflating artificially the estimates that I'm making of their homicide rate. Well, if we assume that in 1981 there was a, an under-registration worse than those of the earlier censuses, which again is implausible, censuses get better over time, not worse. But if there was a very severe under-registration, 20% of indigenous people, while non-indigenous people were fully registered, we would nonetheless still have a relative risk of six and a half between the two ethnicities. So again, our conclusion would re remain very strong. So that, in 15 minutes, is what took me an hour and 25 on the witness stand. <laughs> Although it would be helpful if someone in here could ask me how division works. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, my expertise was in the uh, trial, uh, in that uh, incredible and, and, and frustrating trial, uh, was about races and genocide. I say everyone knows that it's my, well, my expertise, no? The first thing that I, I tried to get with the, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, attorneys was how the racism was a historical, a uh, structural and historical element through history, no? how it, it starts with the racism in the colony and then it starts in the spheres of uh, the 19th century, calling people degenerate, uh, bad people, uh, inferior races. And how it comes a debate, a very great debate around the 30s about the uh, degenerations race and the improvement of the race, the eugenesia, and the extermination of indigenous people. Since beginning of the 19th, uh, uh, since, since the end of the 19th century and beginning uh, in the uh, 20th century, the uh, imaginary of racism and practice of racism in the elite uh, uh, was very common. The extermination of the, popula the population was a very common thing in the uh, newspapers. So that. Uh, that uh, ideology of racism uh, goes through the uh, elite of the power, you know, my, 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 uh, my book about uh, linaje y racismo. And that established and dispersed to everybody in the population. And with the, uh, with the war, I think it's the, the worst uh, part. In the war was everybody start uh, seen the Mayan people as uh, terrorists, as subversive, as guerrilleros, communists. And we have heard many testimonies where they were subversive, insurgentes, guerrilla supported groups. Uh, then the, uh, in, that, in that part, in the 80s, all Indians were subversives, where uh, it's, it was necessary to cut off the seed of evil, uh, to cut the seed from the roots, and to normalize. So they have to be ladinizarlos or to erase the Mayan uh, uh, identity. Mm? Um, it was very in clear in the Sofia plan when they, uh, when, the, when they treat them like animals or like objects, or they are named like filo, eno, and where they, when they uh, kill the children, they say that were chocolates. I didn't know where it was chocolates, why, no? It was referring to the color of their skin, no? And the woman's too. Uh, so I think that the, when the plan, so and the Sophia plan, uh, refers to extermination and total annihilation of the population. And it also mentioned the possibility of destroying the population and the community ties. Many people of their testimonies all in, in the trial uh, report uh, uh, that a big, uh, high number of women and children were murdered uh, a, and were insults and humiliated and raped. Um, okay. So I think that uh, we, we could um, mm, uh, um, affirm that uh, in the case of Guatemala, it was not only racism. Uh, what it it happens, or oh, only a genocide? It was um, it was a two et ethnocide, an ethnocide against the cultural uh, um, the, the cultural uh, Indian uh, Mayan culture. But the problem was the uh, process of dehumanization and devaluation of the other. 
they treat them as animals, carries a heavy burden of racism and stigmatization of the other, understood as inferior or expendable, and the situation of ex is ex execrable of the Mayan uh, and women. But uh, the thing is how to prove the genocide, but the problem is the intention, or the intent to prove of the proposal of to, put a gen uh, to prove a genocide. The premise of the intention to eliminate an ethnic group like, like that cannot be denied by simple assuming that they were subversives or because the roles they played in the conflict. The intent to destroy the group can be inferred from certain assumptions related and interconnected to the crime of genocide. Which are the uh, assumptions that all the, holo the Holocaust and all other uh, genocides, uh, Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur, uh, has uh, the massacres? H how how do you can you uh, uh, difference between genocide, crimes de lesa humanidad, or just collective massacres? No, the presumption of causing mass murders or genocide, uh, as Berdeja, Fernstein, and and all the um, the specialist or the expertise of, uh, of genocide said, is to cause mass, mass murder and genocidal massacres to children, women, elderly civilians, to destroy housing and culture and, and religious images to sites, the existence of uh, clandestine graves and mass graves, the dehumanization and depersonalization of the victims, the declaration of target group as public enemy, intend to erase the elements of ethnic identity, the total of partial destruction, destruction of an ethnic group uh, through a uh, systematic planning of human extermination of the p or the public statement of people involved in extermination. Um, the, um, the model, the type, it's the uh, holo Holocaust, uh, um, the Jewish Holocaust uh, in, in Germany. And uh, other Holocaust uh, or other uh, genocide like uh, Bosnia or Darfur or uh, Rwanda has four, five or six uh, uh, intents of uh, e elimination. We have the nine, the same as the Holocaust. We are the only one that has the same name of presumption, intention of exterminate an ethnic group like that. So my remarks or my conclusions is that historical structural racism, a stereotyping, a stigmatization of indigenous people through the history of Guatemala and the institutionalization of the violence, of the violence and violations contribute, help and facilitate the perpetration of genocide. And it remains one of the more powerful ideological tools to justify the, genocida, the genocidal massacres in the country, since racism was already internalized in the minds and in the hearts of the elites and the perpetrators of genocidal violence. Now we know that in the urban cla middle class, it's already there in the minds and in the hearts of the urban Latino middle class of the um, city of Guatemala. The structural and historical racism ideology contributed to shape the characteristic of the state, of the racist state, discriminatory, inequal, authoritarian, and used the ideological and repressive institutions against the indigenous population in times of crisis dis and, and, and crisis and domination. I think that the consolidation of racism as an ideology of the state reached its apex and showed its peak intensity with the crisis of the oligarchic military government, the emergence of the popular revolutionary movement and the application of the counterinsurgencies. The problem is that the the counter in an uh, the counterinsurgency, the, counter the manuals of the counterinsurgency were applied without limits due to the presence of the racist ideology in society, the historical structural context of racism and the intensification of the uh, stereotyping and stigmatization of the indigenous people uh, 
in the case of the Mayan exiled indigenous people were identified as public enemies of the states and members of the guerrillas. So that was the pattern and modus operandi through all the history in Guatemala. It's not the only one. It has been in Quetzaltenango, in Pazizia, in other moments of the history in Guatemala. So I think that the genocide, it's uh, incrusted, it's internalized in all the country, in all the classes, and meanwhile, more in the Latin urban uh, middle class. In that case, I think that it could appear again in any moment in the future, hmm? because with this trial, we have seen uh, in the papers, in the newspapers, in the mass media, that the blogs or in the commentaries of the urban Latinos middle class were so racist, were so cruel, that they didn't have any empathy, any compassion, any, any kind of poor people, what has happened, oh, what a terrible thing. They didn't have any compassion. They said, no, it's a pity they didn't die every, anybody, everybody in, in the war. So that is really the most uh, mm, worried thing that we should reflect in tomorrow for tomorrow. Thank you.